you for joining us for tonight's show. My name is Keiko Agena, and I am one of the new members of Impro Theater Main Company. Now, we recognize the immense challenges that artists and theater companies are still facing in the light of the pandemic. In our mission to spread joy, Impro has been active throughout the pandemic. In addition to our classes going online, we have presented over 350 live streamed shows for free. So I'm here, you guessed it, uh, to ask for your support in our mission. Now, when you support Impro, you are helping us to offset those costs, uh, to, to expand our programming, to strengthen our community, and to spread joy. And you're not only helping um, the performances, you're also helping the school, which is a vital, safe, welcoming place for artists of all levels and backgrounds. And we've made it very easy to make a donation. Just go to improtheater.com, click the donate button, or you can go to, uh, you can text it from your phone, text IMPRO to 44321, that's 44321, text IMPRO. And we are a nonprofit organization, so it's completely tax deductible. Well, thank you very much for listening to this pitch and for making a donation, and please enjoy the show.
Impro Theater and the cast and crew of this online performance would like to take this time to honor the indigenous peoples of the ancestral and unceded homelands we each inhabit and to consider the legacy of colonization and its far-reaching effects. Thank you for joining us for tonight's show. My name is Keiko Agena, and I am one of the new members of Impro Theater Main Company. Now, we recognize the immense challenges that artists and theater companies are still facing in the light of the pandemic. In our mission to spread joy, Impro has been active throughout the pandemic. In addition to our classes going online, we have presented over 350 live streamed shows for free. So I'm here, you guessed it, uh, to ask for your support in our mission. Now, when you support Impro, you are helping us to offset those costs, uh, to, to expand our programming, to strengthen our community, and to spread joy. And you're not only helping um, the performances, you're also helping the school, which is a vital, safe, welcoming place for artists of all levels and backgrounds. And we've made it very easy to make a donation. Just go to improtheater.com, click the donate button, or you can go to, uh, you can text it from your phone, text IMPRO 
to 44321. That's 44. Three, two, one, text impro, and we are a nonprofit organization, so it's completely tax deductible. Well, thank you very much for listening to this pitch and for making a donation, and please enjoy the show. Impro Theater and the cast and crew of this online performance would like to take this time to honor the indigenous peoples of the ancestral and unceded homelands we each inhabit and to consider the legacy of colonization and its far-reaching effects. as the robot lady said.
Hey everybody, welcome to Impro Talk. I'm your host, Mike Rock. Thank you for joining us. If you are watching or listening live in March of 2022, you should know that Sonder, the improvised podcast, is back for another performance shortly after this show tonight at eight, and then once more tomorrow, Sunday at noon. And, uh, and stay tuned to the Impro Theater YouTube channel for more things. But right now, the uh, issue at hand is our wonderful and delightful special guest who will be here in one second. Jill Bernard is an improviser, an educator, an author, uh, was a, is a founding member of Huge Theater in um, Minneapolis, performing has been performing with Comedy Sports Twin Cities since 1993. Um, and uh, Jill had a has a one woman show called Drum Machine, which has been featured in 40 over 40 improv festivals around the world. She's taught and performed in England, Norway, Australia, Canada, Argentina, Peru, Italy, Germany and most of the United States as well. She was also the recipient in 2005 of the Chicago Improv Festival Avery Schreiber Ambassador of Improv Award, which is no surprise when you meet Jill to know that she is an ambassador, uh, and the 2007 Miami Improv Festival Award for Best Solo Show. There are more credits and uh, uh, laudits that I could list, but let's just talk to Jill right now. Please welcome Jill Bernard. Oh, I love it when it doesn't work. The drama. Jill Bernard, ladies and gentlemen. Hi. Uh, Jill, thank you so much for being here today. Um, and uh, I just, I want to kind of sort of get started by getting like an overview of your, um, I always ask everybody what their like childhood approach to storytelling and being a creator and a creative. I always ask people, were you the ringleader in your house or in your neighborhood for putting on shows and, and doing acting stuff? You know, my mother is a very gifted musician and also was always very creative at telling stories with us. So I think that was part of what we did from very early childhood. But also, I was always a very poor sleeper. And so the way I've always fallen asleep is by laying in bed and making up a story. And I've done that. I still do it. I do it my entire life. I make up a story before I go to bed. And that's how I fall asleep by imagining, I I don't remember any like classic, like putting on a play moments in our neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, well that is so charming to, to to put yourself to sleep by telling a story. Do you, do you, is it, does the inspiration come just from something that happened that day or just anything at all? Is there any sort of? It depends what mood I need to set. For example, uh, last night I couldn't sleep and I needed to be calm. So I imagined that I, I was just a, a human person who'd fallen asleep in a wooded glen and all of the fairyland creatures were observing me, but I just got to lay there. A lot of the stories involved just laying there. <laughs> oh, that's a, I mean, that's, you know? that's great. Like telling your, telling yourself to just, oh, you just need to lay here. You don't need to do anything. Yeah. Uh, and that's 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 been a kind of a, um, a a mental exercise, a training exercise for you. Like to do that every night means that like you're just you're teaching yourself how to be a storyteller every night. Yeah, I think about imagination as rolling. I don't think you can just five o'clock be. Uh, I did once get hired as a consultant, a creativity consultant, and they were like, "Okay, at nine a.m. we'll start being creative." Then we'll take a break for lunch. Then we'll come and like, I can't, that's not, to me, creativity is just something that rolls all day long and your eyes are open and you're noticing things and stories are just happening all the time. Yeah, um, a, a couple of my colleagues talk about the, specifically about, about improv, but also about creativity and storytelling is that stuff is all around us all the time. And what you're doing as an artist or as a creative is just kind of like grabbing a thing and just kind of showing it to everybody. Yeah, there's a there's a little tiny book, uh, part in my book about, um, you know, when a plastic bag blows across your train of your, your line <laughs> of sight for for a minute, you think it's a cat. And then you're like, no, it's just a bag. Don't be stupid. But I think being an improviser, being creative is letting it be a cat for just a little while longer. And maybe it's a cat that can hold groceries. It's just, a yeah, let it be a cat. Uh, I love that you reference that. Jill Bernard's small, cute book of improv, um, which is, 
I remember when I got it, I wrote to you, I don't remember, I, I assume I wrote you on social media or something, but I wrote right away because I was like, I can, you've done the thing that, that I've been meaning to do is have a, a, a very simple, clear, joyful um, guide uh, for approaching improv. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it, it, it deals with using improv in your daily life and, and uh, agreement being the foundation of improv and um and etc and and i just i just it's uh it's fantastic and i wish more improvisers would just go ahead and and i i think improvisers sometimes need permission to understand that they themselves are developing philosophies mm. for example like people who's who studied in the del close tradition feel like they have to live or keith johnstone or whoever like you're not allowed to have your own thoughts and your own theories I think everybody should. And there's a remarkable book by the improv group, um, Parallelogram of Phonograph from Austin, Texas, about how to do narrative improv. And they each wrote a chapter. And I wish every improv troupe would do that. Like if the, if the four of us each write how we're approaching the work and then you look at those four chapters together, like what a cool thing for the public and students, but also for each other. Yeah, and they, they, by the way, that they do fantastic work. Oh, so fantastic. I've, I've, I've never seen them in person. I've only seen video, but um, talk about uh, committed and, uh, and joyful approach to genre uh, work and, and et cetera. Um, uh, so your, your origin story of, of improv at, goes back to at least 93. Did you, when you were in uh, middle school and, and high school and stuff, were you doing um, scripted plays? Were you doing- uh, Yeah, I was doing scripted plays. I got into plays in, in high school and it was delightful. We were just such a lovely pack of nerds having the best <laughs> time. And I did speech team. And then when I graduated, I went to co-college in Cedar Rapids, Iowa and studied theater, studied to do scripted theater. And then I transferred to the University of Minnesota and I was already starting to feel bored by scripted theater. It wasn't really jazzing me the same way. I'm very bad at taking direction and I'm not good at memorizing things. So scripted theater was not really the right fit. And I didn't know what improv was. I had never heard of it. And a classmate at University of Minnesota, Mikey Heinrich, was already playing comedy sports. And he said, hey, you're fun. You should come audition for this show. So I went to see one comedy sports show before my audition. It was a terrible show. <laughs> I've still never seen a comedy sports match that bad. Um, and then I auditioned the next day, like the most casual, relaxed audition you could ever give. Because I was like, this is easy. easy. Uh, they turned out to be great, and that was just a fluke. But yeah, I I think people today uh, like can't imagine that. And I think it was sort of the same when you got into improv. I had no experience. I had never taken an improv class, and I had seen one improv show, and then I became a professional improviser. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's um, yeah. My uh, my, my origin. I, I, in Madison, um, uh, Jill and our fellow Midwesterners, um, in Madison, there, there was a group of students that were doing a show that was um, led by um, some people who had, who had studied in Chicago, who had studied at, at Second City. And, um, and that, was like the, uh, that was like this thing, seeing them do improv games for me back then was like eye-opening. I remember seeing it and thinking, you know, cause I was an actor kid. Uh, also with scripted work and and I was like ah, I can't what, what's happening I can't believe and I auditioned for it several times they were all in college I was in high school and so they were like all right you know thanks kid you know <laughs> <laughs> and then when I was in college I auditioned one more time and then left for long story reasons left town for a while and um not prison and um and then when I came back, they said, oh, we want you in our show now. But then by that time, theater sports in Madison was being was uh, about to start. Um, and, and so I, I, I had to make a choice. And the, the, the Dick Chudnow of, of 
then theater sports, now comedy sports said to me, oh, you can be in both shows. But the people at the other show said, you can't be in both shows. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, I think these are my people over yeah. here. Um, and yet we didn't know, uh, we, we didn't sort of know any better than to say to the audience, oh, stop, like, yeah, that's, this, this didn't work, sorry, <laughs> like, et cetera. Uh -huh. It was just kind of stumbling in the dark at the time. Do you want to know your own part in my origin story? Oh, so here I, I am. Oh, yeah. I would love it. Wow. Here I am starting comedy sports, no improv training. And all they really had to give us that was available at the time was like a stack of four or five pieces of paper that had improv advice on it. And one was like improv advice from Viola Spola and one was from Del Close. And then another one is a piece of paper that says oh. Mike Rock's guidelines for comedy sports players. <laughs> and it has a list of guidelines. And I have no idea if you have any connection yourself to this document or if someone just took notes. No, of I, things I, I authored that document, Jill. Um, Cause I had, I had improv improvisation for the theater. I had, um, I had Impro, I had a book by a guy called Andy Goldberg at the time, and maybe one other, I had like four different things. And, uh, and then I just, I just wrote, I just tried to lift tips off of them and, and write them down into a document for my, for just for my um, classes that I was teaching, because I've been teaching at the Educational Theater Association for decades, and high school kids and high school teachers desperately wanted a handout. They said, your, your class is gonna be much more successful with adults, you know, with teachers and parents, if you have a handout. And so I was like, well, it's improv. Great. And they made me, they kind of like shamed me into writing that. And then I just handed it out at comedy sports events. What I love about this is at the, I mean, I must've gotten this in 93 then, there's, a, there's like books related to improv and it's only three books long on this <laughs> list. It's only, Truth and comedy, impro, and improvisation for the theater. And if you wrote this list today, there'd be hundreds of there'd be a hundred books on there. But I honestly think at the time you wrote this, the only books that were really easy to get your hands on were those three. And I I had to get them through interlibrary loan. Like they were there was not Amazon. <laughs> there was not Amazon.com. I think I had to like make the Minneapolis Public Library get me these books because they just <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Wow. You'll have to send me a photo of that document because I, I bet will. I don't have it anymore. Um, There's some really good thoughts on here that I bet you still believe. Um, be fearless. Follow the impulse. Remove jewelry and accessories before <laughs> taking the field. <laughs> um, these are great, but that's my favorite. Remove jewelry. Yeah, and clearly, before taking clearly because if yeah. you take a class with Jill Bernard, you will be told, uh, please wear closed toe nah, shoes. You better close those toes off. You keep those yeah. little toesies away Somebody's from Somebody's going to step improv. on your foot. Somebody's going to step on your foot. You'll sprain your ankle. It'll ruin the workshop. Yeah. We'll all have to stop and support yeah. you going to the hospital. These are good little tips, though. Make a choice and see it through. Like I think a lot of people when they're first improvising are okay with making a choice, but the like see it through part is so hard to have somebody be like, go ahead, see it through. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, the modern day kind of phrasing for that is is first choice, best choice. And, yeah. and just su support support what's already on the table as opposed to trying to find a new shiny object. Yeah. What are you, what's your take now? Because uh, it says avoid asking questions, and I like already how you phrased it. Because it wasn't like don't ask questions. <laughs> it was like avoid asking questions. Have you drilled down on that thought? Oh yeah, yeah. At all because because for it, modern times. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, and decades ago, because it's, you know this document we're looking at is um, pretty old. But uh, yeah, it, it, asking questions obviously is uh, improvising is real life, and real life is improvising. So um, there, there are no sort of hard and fast rules in the way I teach anymore about that kind of thing. Um, if you, it's, I, I, I do think that when people are just getting their feet under them improvising, they should maybe be more like a 
like att attorneys are taught to not ask questions of witnesses that they don't have a question they have an answer to right. um, and um i think i have that right um uh yeah so, so if, you, if you're going to try to get a witness to reveal something you should probably know what you're talking about before you ask a question um but like i slightly less experienced improvisers, I, th I think I kind of say like, look, if, if you if you find yourself asking a lot of questions in a scene, maybe after the scene kind of do a little examination as to what caused you to rely so much on asking questions, but maybe during the scene, just sort of pause for a second <laughs> and see what happens with the answer to a question as opposed to uh, continuing on this in inter interrogatory route <laughs> yeah. with your partner yeah um, <laughs> that's a good way to put it that's a good way to put it for people who are really trapped i sometimes give them a little tip to immediately answer your own question mm. if you're like what's that over there oh it's the christmas tree mm. like get exactly. it rolling that like i do know because i think that's i always want to say to people you know like yes but that's not really helpful coaching they're yeah. like you know what's over there and they're like no i really i really don't <laughs> stop ask at, <laughs> no i don't know if there's nothing over there from my perspective as an adult who's not accustomed to playing yeah <laughs> it's it's sort of uh the the directive uh, sometimes that I, that I've found myself saying is is like act as the act as if your character is a person who knows stuff, and so you you you're in a room, whether it's the post office or a barn or on a snowmobile or in a spaceship, you're in a place, so your character would probably know why they are there. So if you're there, your your character probably knows why they're there. So just be an advocate for your character and, and know why you're there. And, and, and I think there's lots of like exercises that help people practice, like experts exercises. I remember once reading about a, a test, a creativity test. They gave a creativity test to a group of bankers and they scored relatively low. <laughs> and then they said to a group of bankers, pretend that you're hippies. And they gave them the creativity test and they scored much higher like wow. pretending yeah pretending to be hippies pretending to be hippies made them score higher on a creativity test and that sounds like permission right yeah. giving yourself permission to be creative and permission to know what's over there in invisible space or to know how this factory mechanism works yeah we use that phrase, I think I picked up that particular word from Stephen Kieran about permission. Just give yourself permission, you know, give yourself permission to ex experiment, to push the outer edges of the envelope, so to speak, and et cetera. Just give yourself permission to, to know yeah. things, et cetera. Yeah, which is um, fantastic. I want to ask you about the, the, what you just hit on for a second is the chasm, the chasm is maybe a too strong a word, the the divergence between working with uh, actors, writers, directors, um, hams, uh, you know, <laughs> nerds, etc., who just like really want to get into whatever improv you put in front of them or whatever acting exercise you put in front of them, which, versus working with a team of insurance salespeople or or corporate type people and. We're, you, we're, we're basically using the same tools. We got a tool belt with, you know, the, with a hammer and a saw and a pickaxe and a whatever else. And we walk into the room and with one group, we use them in one way. And with the, with the other group, we kind of have to be like, all right, hold on a second. <laughs> um, how do you, can, can you describe the difference? Yeah, I don't really care about applied improv. <laughs> like I want to talk to, to artists about art. I don't really care very much about doing improv with people who aren't using it to make art. But I, I, I'll do it because you're right. It absolutely is super useful. I think the happiest I am when I'm teaching an improv workshop to non-improvisers, the happiest I am is when I just pretend they're a very untalented group of beginners. <laughs> And I don't do much, and I don't do much of anything different. I just do the same. Um, I treat them the same. 
part of my philosophy of teaching improv at huge theater, I like to teach all of the students as if I believe they're going to come out the other end a professional improviser. And I, I drill that for myself as a teacher so that I never give up on anybody. And if they decide that they just want to do it for fun or if they just wanted to spend eight weeks out of their house on a Tuesday night, that's their decision. But I want to treat them with the respect and investment as if I believe this person is going to come out the other end a professional improviser. Man, I, I love that so much. Yeah. I just, I, 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 would, I would like to, th I've never put it in the words like that. I would like to think that that's how I also teach. I think, I think it is. Um, and it gives me goosebumps to hear you say it right now. Uh, yeah. Because it's, that's just having respect and faith and lifting people up. And um, I may, I just, I, uh, that is, that is great, Jill. That's, that's, we a, already, that's a um... second book right there. <laughs> that <We> sentence. <laughs> we already talked about Stephen Kieran, but you know, Stephen Kieran was a student of Rafe Chase and my whole life as an improv teacher was changed by one sentence that Rafe said in an interview. Rafe was talking about his trio partner, Stephen Kieran and Tim Orr, and they were his students originally. And he said, yeah, I was just training them up to play with them. Like he wasn't thinking of himself as a teacher above the students. He was thinking of training them up because he was so eager to play with them. And I think, God, what a beautiful, what a beautiful proposition that, that I'm is, not uh, imparting some wisdom. Which I'm just raising you up so that we have a chance to play. That is that is exactly it. Um, uh, Rafe, Chase, Tim Moore, and Stephen Kieran, of course, three for all, and uh, members of Bats Improv in San Francisco and. And I remember in Madison, um, I don't want this to sound self-aggrandizing, but I, <laughs> I know that, that, that people would gravitate toward our show and some people would gravitate toward our show just to be fans every week and other people clearly just wanted to be on, on stage doing it with us. And I remember I was doing workshops for the first few years of our, of our existence back in Madison with like three people at a time, me and like three people or me and four people and et cetera, just to train them up to, because they were, they were happy, excited, positive, talented people. And I was like, I want these guys on stage as soon as possible. Yeah. Yeah. That is, yeah. That's a great reminder as well. Um, I have so much admiration and respect for you saying, I, I, I'm not interested in, a, in applied improv. Oh. Because God bless the people who are. <laughs> yes, because because again, back in the day, I used to do so many. I mean, they're still on my my long form resume of like doing classes at whatever you know, General Electric and and et, et cetera. Um, but I I gravitated away from it, uh, if that's the right word. Um, yeah. I, I, and. And, and while I wouldn't say no to a to, to the opportunity again, it's um that's a different animal. That's really a different animal. Yeah, and there is an interest. There are always interesting conversations to have there, because it is giving them tools to use and helping them. I, I made a major shift this year. I used to really hate doing corporate workshops. They just I I really hated it, and then I realized that because uh, I'd always been code shifting for them. Like I thought if I'm speaking to a group of corporate people, I should speak like a corporate person. And it only occurred to me post pandemic, mid pandemic, haha. It only occurred to me mid pandemic that they are hiring me because they want to alter who they are and how they operate. So I should stay myself and not code shift to match them. I should bring myself, my authentic self, and present what I have to present that I hope they will find special and useful and, and not try to make it, not, not try to fit it in to their world so aggressively and help them let, they're the subject matter experts in what they do. There's no preparation I could do to understand how to make a heart valve better than they do. So let's let them do that. And I'll just present it from from what it's meant to me. 
and hopefully they'll find that useful. That is uh, also uh, a, a great realization and, and shift to make. Um, I remember back in the in the early days reading like um, in search of excellence and uh, how to win friends and influence people and how to negotiate anything and Zig Ziglar and all these like Tony Robbins and all these people at reading these books because I wanted to be able to walk into those workshops and quote the um, the corporate motivational tomes that they were all being told to read and it worked I mean I did I did but but I think now I, I think I would follow your philosophy of being like I'm I think I'm being hired to be me yeah and you know what's funny the statistics are the same like of the improv contacts we get, we land, I don't know, 50% of them. And if that hasn't changed based on whether I'm trying to, to be what I think they want me to be or whether I'm being myself. So the impact has been <laughs> negligible and I'm much happier. So why not do it that way? Yeah. And I, it feels like the workshops are better. It feels like without that veil over me, I'm able to be more responsive to what's really happening in the room and give them, I mean, I, I, when I started doing corporate workshops in 1998, it was pre any kind of economic downturn. So nobody, you could do whatever you wanted. You could pay, play bunny bunny for half an hour and nobody expected it to make any impact on the bottom line. No one was gonna ask you to prove the value of improv application, you know, and there was no measurables. It was just for fun. And then, of course, people started keeping a tighter eye on that. And there were all these scandals where a company would go, like, take their company to Las Vegas to build bicycles as a team building, and it would be a big scandal. So now people look at it under a, a tighter lens. And I'm I'm happy for that because, yeah, I do want it to be meaningful. I I read, like, a list of, of suggested exercise for corporate workshops once and one of them was labeled this is a good time killer like <laughs> oh so you're not trying to make this a great workshop you're trying to to get to the end of it okay <laughs> wow this is a good time killer this is a good time killer <laughs> man that person's cynical <laughs> wow, that, is, that is dark <laughs> uh, holy cow um i would go i would go build bicycles for a team that'd be great thing. with your yeah. colleagues come on yeah um uh wow that's yeah well that's that that is that is that the kind of art meets commerce thing that we all deal with as, that you deal with as a as a um a person who has real estate in the in the theater game um not only not only a group of artists but also actually you know bills to pay and etc is that jill if if the president called you and said what can the united states do better to support the arts <laughs> general, what, what do we what do we need to convince people of why is it such a struggle yeah that's really interesting because it feels like entirely culturally we're aligned and always have been to undervalue what art can do and how art is a tool to to combat everything we're bothered by you know art helps uh mental health art helps violence art helps so many things uh it enriches education just in across the board and i yeah i would never know how to how to retune society to to put art where it <laughs> belongs or like create a culture within the united states where arts gets more official sponsorship um we, you've traveled like i i've traveled to other countries and there are other places where the arts are more uh woven into into the government support and there's not an uprising in the streets every couple yeah. of years over it. And it's, um, yeah, I know, well, you know, I feel quite lucky. Huge Theater got a lot of support financially in the early pandemic. Like we got some small business administration loans. We got some loans from the, so we got some grants from the Minnesota State Arts Board 
Minnesota itself as a state tends to be very supportive of the arts. So I feel like we've really lucked out. We've got, we also got some even super, super local, hyper local Lake Street grants uh, just for our neighborhood. So I think there is, there is support, but it's, uh, it's always going to be some secondary, third, tertiary priority. Yeah. Are you the person who has to write those grant applications or do you have a no. team? Or, yeah. um, no, my <laughs> colleague, Sean Dillon does. He's much better at, at making it sound pretty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm just like, Hey, give us money. It's but an Sean, art. Like, yeah, it really is. Uh, it well, really good, is. good on him for being able to make that happen while that is. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. I, in my brain, huge theater moved into a new space like three years ago. Oh, OK. We never did move into that new space. Oh, that new space we did not move into. We tried to do a capital campaign. It went horribly. Um, oh, we okay. didn't we were supposed to raise like you know, $2 million and we raised nowhere near that. And it was a really tiny time frame. And the bank got nervous and just backed out of it. And we were like, what? And they were like, no. <laughs> okay. So that's, that's why uh, yeah, I was yeah. confused. About yeah. It. There's so a lot some, of yeah. press about it. There was a lot of hope because we wanted to buy a building. We rent now yeah. and we were hoping to buy and, you know, as difficult as that was to fail, it was one of those failures that teaches you a lot. Like, <laughs> we, we learned a lot about what we were striving for, and we made a lot of new friends, like people who I think will help us when it does come time to move to a new building. And I think it was also, like, super valuable to learn the size of of what our current support base has to offer like we're not we don't have millionaire friends and that's fine that's great <laughs> i love the friends that we do have um, and i love that like we're in such a better position than we were 11 years ago like the amount of fundraising we were able to do that the space for the space that did not happen was so much richer than what we did when we initially opened. When we initially opened, we had nothing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and your, your um, space is in Uptown. Um, tell us, give us a little, can you give us a, a, a very brief tour of, of the twin, the twin cities arts scene and where st stuff is? And yeah. Um, Uptown is my love and my heart to the degree where I'm unwilling to accept that it's changing as a neighborhood. When I moved into Uptown in like 1995 or whatever, it was the hip, cool neighborhood, a lot of artists, a lot of cool things going on. And over the years, it's kind of shifted. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of condo buildings, huge, tall condo buildings, and uh, the kind of bars where you wait in a long line in the cold to go in to do nothing. Like, I don't know what they do. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's not the neighborhood it was. There's a lot less independent stores. There used to be really cool stores and galleries and things. There still is. It's not as as strong as it was. And this at the, at that time, this is where the Brave New Workshop was. And now the Brave New Workshop is downtown. So the Brave New Workshop is the longstanding heart of Minneapolis Improv. It was founded in 1951. That's Dudley Riggs. Yeah, Dudley Riggs founded it. So that theater was in Uptown. Comedy Sports was in Uptown. And then we opened huge to make a triangle out of those spaces because it was nice to be in a neighborhood where people already knew what improv was. It wasn't a long walk to explain it to people. And then, yeah, people were already coming to this neighborhood and it was great. Um, and of course, Brady Workshop has moved and comedy sports closed and now does spaces at, at various venues. We don't have our own, our own venue. Um, but I would say in terms of the rest of the art scene in Minneapolis, there's a lot happening in Northeast Minneapolis. That's where Strike Theater is. They do sketch comedy and improv. 
and storytelling and a bunch of things. There's a lot of theaters over on that side of town. Um, and then like downtown Minneapolis really has the big theaters where you'll see Broadway shows touring through. And there was a time when Minneapolis had the reputation for a, a great test audience. So <laughs> everybody would test their Broadway shows here. We saw Lion King first. Oh. Um, because they really think like Minneapolis audiences are are polite but honest, you know, simple but relatively sophisticated. <laughs> so like, yeah, somewhere between Peoria and New York sure. is Minneapolis audiences. Um, so yeah, downtown has has the bigger the bigger rental houses, and then over by the Mississippi River, the mighty Mississippi, you'll see the Guthrie Theater, <laughs> which is the biggest regional scripted theater. Uh, it's really a beautiful space, and they do a wide range of like classic plays, modern plays. Um, and Minneapolis is known as a theater town, and I really think it is. You can really see a lot in various neighborhoods. You know, the, the city, the Twin Cities is, is so much more sophisticated artistically than a lot of people give it credit for. <laughs> you know, the, it's got such a rich music scene and art scene and theater scene and improv and comedy and et cetera. And um, uh, I, I, I mean, I'm biased because I grew up in the Midwest and, and yeah. always felt like, um, uh, the, you know, Minneapolis, St. Paul and, and Madison had kind of kindred spirits in a lot of ways. Um, so you, you, uh, at, at huge have lots of different, uh, you have, you're a host theater, you have sort of like home groups that perform, uh, can, can you give us like some, just give us like a little, uh, list of some of the shows that yeah. are happening. Yeah. Most of the shows at huge are things that people proposed. We produce, we produce a handful of shows in house every year. For example, we're just about to open Kabam, which is an improvised comic book format that originally started in New York. Cool. Um, and we have shows like that on the weekends. And then one of my favorite things is just huge Wednesdays. Four different improv groups perform on Wednesdays. And it's kind of a a place to to grow because these are groups that we think are really talented and could have a weekend show a main stage show main a main time slot show um but giving them a chance to perform on wednesdays really builds their muscles the oldest improv show we have is something called improv -a go go every sunday long before there was a huge theater we've been doing improv -a go go you put your name in a lottery and the different improv teams get get chosen by random chance. It'll be four different improv troops every night. And some of them are great and some of them are terrible. <laughs> and, it's, uh, and it's pay what you like. So you did it to, you know, you can set your own income investment. Um, and it's really charming because it, to me, it ends up being the widest range of what you could see. Because you might see a student group that has never performed before, or you might see a duo that's been around for 20 years, but just wants to try out something new and kind of wants a workspace to do that with low pressure. And that used to be well, like 20 years ago, that was one of the only improv shows you could see on a regular basis. And it was that there were not very many places. We, we opened huge because the only place you could see long form improv was improv a go go on Sunday nights and then one student show that uh, the Brave New Workshop had and the rest of it you had to kind of keep your eye out. <laughs> and we were like, <laughs> wouldn't that be nice to not have to keep your eye out and have a place where you could just go any night and see a different show. So on the on Fridays and Saturdays, we tend to have three shows and there will all be like proposals from independent improv groups to to put up something. There's a group that's been performing the entire time we've been open called Bearded Company that specialize in uh, some kind of uh, genre narrative, like they'll do it, a D&D &D or a space or a cowboy or a, yeah, different things. Um, 
and the, that's yeah and that the part of the bearded company uh, uh has relocated to los angeles they, they have, have yeah have bearded company la and and bearded company twin cities which is super cool that right they, they have that and uh um i also noticed that there's troika which is uh uh trios yeah uh, we can't and, we can't talk about it my husband just got eliminated from troika last night <laughs> He's you, if you hear open weeping in the background, it's because oh, no. they didn't make it. They didn't make it through to the to the finals. Oh, so heavy sorry. day in our house. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Well, he can. Yeah, he can uh, jump into the Dino Jam, which yeah, uh, that's true. Happens that's true. on Thursdays. <laughs> yeah, uh, he said um, we. You know, if you lose a troika, you can go get Taco Bell. And if you went at ta at Troika, you could go get more Taco Bell. So we went and got Taco Bell, and he's pretty okay. He's okay. Um, so many. I mean, like the there's so many. You know, I have I have uh, other friends besides you at 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 Huge, and there's so many different shows um, in uh, in the Twin Cities. I mean, it's just it's just kind of uh, mind boggling. Um, and and you you manage to have um, classes and shows and um, it, it 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 feels it's so impressive it's so exciting to know that that there's a place um, you know a home for all these different groups and all these different formats and styles and and that sort of thing and that you you have a performance development you know tryout with on Wednesdays kind of thing where people can just get up there and and see if it's working and how it works like our mission was to be a resource like uh, which i think is a is a great a healthy way to think about it like we're a resource if you as an individual person want to succeed or you as an improv team want to succeed in improv we want to give you what you need to make that happen if it's more classes if it's some training, if it, we do an artist summit every year where we talk about things that you might not know, like how to run an audition or how to get your show some publicity like that. Like we want, we want to be the, a place where you can get anything you need. And also a lot of what we do is about, we call it amplifying voices where we're trying to find and encourage the people who traditionally have not been part of the improv tradition, um, people who are BIPOC or or disabled or older or queer or anybody who's felt like sort of othered or left out of improv. At, wouldn't it be great? The dream is that huge can not only create a space where you'll feel like you own this space, this is your space, you can make use of it, but also help you help you keep growing in that and and make something that you can be proud of and feel artistically fulfilled through. That is wonderful. Yeah. And I the the description is that huge improv theater is an artist led nonprofit dedicated to supporting Twin Cities improv community through performance and education. And um, being a, a, an inclusive space and a space for development and growth and um, and community um, is just so lovely. I mean, it's just such a it's such a wonderful real world application of what what we were thinking of when we first were learning improvisation. Anything's possible, and and everybody should everybody's welcome. Everybody should come in and and try it. Um, and you're, and the huge theater is living that uh, concept, living that um, uh, mission, I guess is a good way to put Yeah, it. and I mean, we grew into it because I think everyone starts an improv theater or an improv troupe the same way. We're just a bunch of friends who want to make shit up together. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, what has to change as you mature is who's in that group of friends. Right? Uh, can you widen? Can you widen that sphere and make sure uh, the group of friends reflects the city in which you live, reflects the community that you want to to have around you? Can you expand it to be truly inclusive 
because we, like you say, we know how much improv can do to make people's life feel, feel rich and creative and fun and happy. Yeah. And it's, it's just, it just feels in the, in the way that it feels good as a director or as a workshop presenter to see somebody's eyes light up in a scene or in an exercise or, or after the workshop or something like that, it must feel wonderful to be a co-founder of a place that is doing that for people, you know, many nights of the week. Yeah. Um, if you sit at the front desk at huge, when there's three classes going on in the basement, the theater and the playroom, you can hear all of them. And I love it. Like, <clears throat> first of all, it's the only place you work where if there's open screaming, no one calls the police or does anything about it. If someone's just full on screaming, it's fine. It's part of it. But I really love hearing the waves of laughter, the waves of funny voices and, and great sounds all come in, just the energy of it. I love, I love being in the space as that happens. And then from that seat, when the classes take a break, I love how they they, before they leave, they stand outside for a little while in a circle, which is funny because you know they were just in the other room standing in a circle yeah. and they go leave, walk through the lobby and stand outside in a circle because they just can't bear to let go of that right away. And they stay in that feeling for a second before they go on with their afternoon. And I just love that. I, I love, okay, I love any time I see friendship <laughs> mm, yeah. even if it's like you see a, a duck and a puppy together and you're like oh they're <laughs> friends I just love seeing friendship it's one of my favorite things to see so when the students are forming that amicable bond and and I realized how many people met their best friend at huge or met their life partner at huge and I just feel this weird source of happiness and pride that we made a a place where that was possible and i mean i i would extend that to the larger world just think about how many people met through some form of improvisation and yeah. became best friends became life partners you know um or just opened up a whole new part of their life that they had not even known was possible and a whole yeah. new way of approaching life um yeah, maybe they're a better dad or a better accountant or, be yeah. or a better friend just from having had some improv training. And then they go on to influence other people in a positive yeah. way and, and et cetera, which is, you know, it, let's not get too heady, but it's pretty amazing to think about um, the how the positivity ripples outward. Yeah, I thought uh, they, there's a saying, I'm going to misquote it. Uh, there's a saying, I don't want to carpet the world. I just want to hand out slippers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, I can't carpet the world. I'm misquoting that. It's Buddha or somebody good. Um, <laughs> what a fantastic quote. That's so great. <laughs> it, it, regardless of how accurate the yeah. version is. Like, just, uh, yeah, just, uh, I can't, I, it's, it, we can't make the world better. I think if, yeah, it's it's too much. It's too much uh, to make the world better. But yeah, can we can we shine a light for each other? Can we hand out some slippers? Can we <laughs> can yeah. we make it easier? Can we share some joy for two hours a week, and then go back? Like that, it was like um being in Minneapolis during the uprising after George Floyd's murder. We all had to be very aware of what we needed. We had to be really honest. People got really honest. If they were standing in a room and they needed not to be there anymore, people got really great at saying like, hey, I have to go. And everybody else got really bad at being like, okay, see you later. Got, everyone got really good at being like, okay, see you later and just let them go and let them do what they need to do. We got, all got really like aware of, of, of self care taking because there was so much weight on everybody, especially people of color, um, especially people in Minneapolis, in South Minneapolis, um, but then also in North Minneapolis, like the pressure was everywhere. Sure. And we got really good at like using it, using improv when we could 
as a way to lighten that load temporarily because it was so much. And so we were really gentle with each other. If we had a rehearsal schedule and you couldn't make it, you couldn't make it. And if you if we had a show and you didn't have it in you, you didn't have it in you and nobody was mad. And I hope that element stays. I hope we like we were just laughing about it the other day, how often the expectation before ever, 2020 was that you're going to power through. Like Hall's cough drops have all these encouraging sayings about how get just power through. You could do it. But not powering through has a particular beauty to it. <laughs> I mean, it's so elegant to say we learned to be honest about what we need and we learned how to be aware of and respect what one another needs. That's just a beautiful way of putting it. And in, instead of st turning to someone and say, look at this, look at this Hall's cough drop wrapper that says you're supposed to power through, come on. Um, that's just, um, that's a really wonderful, that's a wonderful sentiment. Uh, we certainly got up, uh, you know, turn, upended um, in mid 2020, you know, with George Floyd's murder and the, and the, and the, the um, I guess the renewed awareness on the part of a lot of people of, of the injustice in the world, in the country, and being artists and being hypersensitive to, um, I guess, one another's um, expression and one another's creativity, but then also extending that to empathy about feelings and empathy about um, self-care and that sort of thing is, uh, I mean, that's if, if there is a positive outgrowth, that's, that is it. Yeah. It was certainly uh, then thrown, we were certainly then thrown another <laughs> wrench in the works uh, with the, um, when, when everything got closed down because of the pandemic. And, and you uh, went online with teaching and with performances and, and, and the whole thing. How is, what's going on right now with transitioning into uh, live performances, teaching live classes and, and that kind of thing is, yeah, it's going really great. We're just wrapping up our second semester of in-person classes. We made the class size much smaller and everybody's wearing masks uh, and no contact. And they've really been lovely classes. Uh, att attendance is terrible, <laughs> I think, because everyone still has that spirit of like, my priorities have changed. I got to not be here right now. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't bother me at all. Like there's really this feeling of everyone is doing absolutely their best and everyone's giving it what they can. And it's really, yeah, bringing the classes back in person was really important because a lot of people didn't want to do the online classes and it just wasn't the right, the right fit for them. And I think like the first, the first semester was you could see people sort of dipping their toe in, like there was this extra level of caution. People are always kind of nervous their first day of improv, but then there was this other like global nervous on top of it. Sure. Uh, but it's been really, yeah, just really lovely. It's kind of challenging as an administrator because like there are people who, stop taking improv classes in March of 2020 who are ready now to come back. And we don't have space for those people because we only have enough class space for the people who are in classes currently. For example, if you're currently in a 101, we have enough 201 space for you. We don't have a lot of extra spots for somebody who's like, hey, I remember improv. <laughs> I wish we did. I wish we did. But it we, uh, um, I don't want to overextend anyone. I don't want to ask teachers to do more than they have energy for, because I think that's a bad plan. Um, I don't want to start renting other theater space to make room for classes, because that that's always a bit complicated. Um, 
so trying to keep it small when the demand is large is really interesting and also like there's no like the the bonding that a class has when they go through all the class levels together is a lot different than when random people hop in at different levels oh, yeah, so of it's course. it can work and also it can be an absolute failure so it's been really really interesting seeing what classes form a tight bond and community inside their class and what classes are just a hodgepodge of of strangers who all had thursday free <laughs> or whatever <laughs> or whatever <laughs> i'll take a, a bike assembly class or i'll take an improv class yeah. um uh i i think the the thing that's that's going to happen is we, we will eventually in theaters and and classrooms and etc will eventually be back to what we considered basically normal um and I, I i i think my philosophy at the moment is to reserve judgment about and 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 not make predictions and instead say like all right this is what's working right now um this is what people are capable of doing right now in this moment and in three months it'll probably be a little bit different and in six months it might be different again etc um but that is what our training has taught us to be ready for um, yeah is is expect the unexpected and yeah you know uh i i mispredicted the peak of the omicron wave Oh, okay. And I had classes scheduled to start a little bit early, a little <laughs> too early than one would want. And so I had to shift everything. I think three, I had to shift it all three weeks down the road. And I was super impressed by the willingness and flexibility. Everybody was like, yep, I got you. Like, yep, makes sense to me too. Nobody was mad. Nobody, I think we refunded three people who had travel plans or or something after you know but like yeah nobody was mad it turns out um uh, yeah that's been humbling in a beautiful way to to be able to say to students like hey we need your help making this work out <laughs> yeah. right now yeah. we're in the middle of registering new classes and we just got a new website and it's not working great uh, students are having trouble registering for class and everyone is being so cool about it oh. they're all trying to troubleshoot it like one student found a secret back door where you could log in <laughs> i was like good on you <laughs> um, like yeah i just love that it is it's an improvisational spirit to be like okay tell us when we'll go you know we're gonna keep trying to register for class and and uh, as my friend Tatiana has taught me, Tatiana Godfrey, um, who's part of Impro and and uh, um, comes from Cincinnati, but has lived in New York and and and, and etc. She said, "Look, we just all need to remember to assume best intentions. We just we need to we need to think. Everybody's trying their best. Everybody's bringing what they can, and we need to assume best intentions of one another." Yeah, because you know. When I'm late, it's because traffic's bad. When you're late, it's because you're a monster who doesn't respect other people's time. <laughs> that, is, that is so, so true. It's an easy trap for people to fall into. Um, uh, so you, you teach tons and tons of different uh, workshops all over the world. Um, I, I, did, I wanna ask you about one, if that's okay. Sure. Um, there's a workshop that you teach called the fireball theory. Yeah. Um, uh, exercises to help you improvise faster and harder that, so that you in, in, faster and harder than you can judge yourself. Um, uh, it, let's talk about that for just a second. So frequently what, what happens, particularly with people that are newer to, to improv, but certainly with people who've been improvising for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years or more, is that we will have a moment uh, in the middle of a scene, in in the middle of whatever we're doing while we're improvising, where we're suddenly questioning our own impulse or questioning our own um, uh, thoughts or, or or something like that, and it can really it can really trip you up. It can really 
cause the light in your eyes to dim and your scene partner to look at you and be like, wait, where did you go? Um, can you tell me about how yeah. you approach that? Yeah, well, because when you're, to me, when you're improvising, it's like when you're under the water and uh, you're just swimming along and then something happens that pulls you out of the water. Like you forget the other character's name or you forget what beat of the Herald you're on or somebody in the audience dropped a bottle or you become aware that we only have 30 minutes left on the clock or, you know, uh, and you're pulled out of the water and it takes you a long time to get back in then go swimming again. Um, it's so funny. Fireball Theory is one of my older workshops. I'm really curious what my workshops will be when we get back out on the road, you know, because we've been off the road since 2020. Like, I think the last improv festival I went to was in February 2020. Do I still believe everything that I believed? <laughs> Will my workshops be the same? Uh, people keep asking me for workshop descriptions and I send them the same page and I wonder if I mean it. Um, but yeah, Fireball Theory as originally intended was exactly for the moment you're talking about where actually it was, it's mostly for the moment at the beginning of the scene when, when people feel like they they can't get in there because they don't have something great to say. Um, um, <laughs> and the doubt and uh, the reason it's called the fireball theory is because uh, it makes me think of an action movie when you're standing there and, and there's a big fireball rolling toward the hero and they always somehow jump out of the way. Uh, I think of the dog boomer in Independence Day who at the last minute jumps and lands in the arms of Vivica A. Fox. And if you outrun your fear and doubt and loathing and judgment, you can land in a scene as beautiful as Vivica A. Fox. And that is the fireball theory. Um, I love that. Yeah, it's just a bunch of tools, mainly for beginners, mainly for that moment at the beginning of the scene when you're really wondering what's the perfect thing to say and, and teaching people that there is no perfect thing to say. We're just going to make it. We're just going to make it the perfect thing to say. And it's a lot of, of exercises on impulse, like uh, just learning to pick one, making one choice. Um, Deepak Chopra says there is no inherent right or wrong. You just make a decision and the world aligns itself after the fact. So how can you just train people to make a decision and not worry too much about what that decision is? <laughs> Yeah, that, um, I frequently say that, that sort of the kind of cheesy <laughs> phrase, don't let the perfect, oh, we got a dog situation here. Uh, <laughs> don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, which yeah. is just like, you're good enough. You, you, your presence is going to contribute to discovering what the story is and finding out where we're going. So just be you and don't let your writer brain complicate things by trying to conjure up something that, that you're then going to go in and offer. Just just offer yourself and follow your curiosity rather than your judgment. What are you curious about? Like, Oh, isn't this interesting? Instead of leaning back, like, Oh no, why, why is the steering wheel on the wrong side of the car? Why not <laughs> lean forward? Oh, isn't this interesting? The steering wheel is on the wrong side of the car. I'm curious about that. Does that mean we're in England? Maybe let's be in England Yeah, and go from there. Fantastic. Follow the curiosity. Um, I wish we could talk for a much longer time, but we'll have to. But do your that. dog says no. Yes, she's got. A, <laughs> she's holding. She's actually holding us. She's the only dog with thumbs. She's holding a stopwatch, oh, looking at no. me, and going like, "Come on, buddy." <laughs> um, uh, well, Jill Bernard, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, do, so you're you're a. I think you're scheduled to do a festival in the not too distant future. Is that? Is that right? Do I have that right? Did yeah, I see the that? Happy Valley XL Festival in Pennsylvania uh, is coming up. Yeah, pretty soon. That'll That's be exciting. fun. They're taking um, submissions still if you want your group to go. Oh, nice. yeah, yeah. Um, and we'll we'll catch up another time and talk more. And hopefully the world will be a... And we'll smile a lot. Smile a lot, <laughs> says Mike Rock. <laughs> Uh, I really want to pour <laughs> over that pour over that document and see how much red red ink I have to use. Um, thank you so much. Go check out hugetheater.com, spelled exactly how you'd think it would be spelled. A huge and and it's T H E A T E R theater.com. 
and find out all the different shows that are going on in Huge. In uh, <laughs> Jill, thank you so much for being on Impro Talk. Thank you. And we'll see you next time, everybody. <laughs>